I love this time of year for several reasons. Number one, because I can look at the calendar and I can measure the amount of days now until camps open up and we're almost done talking and we actually get to hear the sound of pads popping and we get real practice reports. Oh, that's great. Do you know what else happens this time of year? We really find out who can win a championship because we really start diving hardcore headlong into roster evaluation. What does history say? What does the history of college football tell us is necessary to win a national championship? That's the truth that you and I have to uncover tonight because there is some pretty hard data out there. Enter Budrick Elliott because it turns, it turns out it's really not all that difficult to figure this out. Bud, uh, I call him Budrick, you can call him whatever you want to. Bud Elliott has put out for quite a while the blue chip ratio, sort of the father, if you will, of the blue chip ratio. And all that is, is a measure, kind of a, a scan across the sport of everyone's roster. What we're trying to figure out here and what history has told us we need to figure out is how many teams out there are above 50% of their total roster being comprised of four and five star recruits. That's it. It's really that simple, believe it or not. And this year we got 15 of them. So I'm gonna break this down because I'm not so much going to go one through 15 down the list. It's the usual suspects and maybe a couple of your surprised are still in there. But I want to give you a couple of takeaways on this, and I want to ask if you see the same thing happening that I see happening. So you got 15 teams total. Again, this, this percentage, if you're watching on YouTube, that's just the total percentage of that team's roster that is comprised of former four- and five-star recruits. Alabama's almost at 90%. It used to be rare that anyone was at 70%. Bama's almost at 90%. I'll get back to that in a second, because that's an indicator of a much bigger issue to me. The SEC has six of these 15 teams. Next up is the Big Ten with three. Uh, the ACC and the Big 12 each have two. Notre Dame's in there. The G5 is not even remotely close. So I'll tell you what I thought when I looked at this list. It's on 247sports.com right now. Bud does it every year. And so I'm interested in what he said about transfers. Because, you know, he kind of summarized it the way I am. I really don't know how to gauge that yet. It's in there. If you want to go look at the secondary not the tertiary or quiduciary, but the secondary list, and you want to look at transfers infused with this, that's in that article on 247sports.com. But as for now, as for this moment, we're still talking about just classical high school recruits. I'm thinking about the news that just broke over the past year in our sport and how it ties into this. What I'm talking about is about a year ago, probably this week, a year ago, we had OU in Texas. They're going to move to the SEC. 2025 at the latest. I happen to think it'll happen before that. A couple of weeks ago, what did we hear? We hear USC, UCLA, they're on the move to the Big Ten. Let's just hit the fast forward button. Boom. To a point in time where both of those moves have happened. I am a believer, after looking at this, that in that world, if you're in the Big 12 or the Pac-12, even if nothing changed, even if those conferences just remained as they are, You'd have to totally recalibrate the world you live in. No longer would those folks wake up in the morning telling themselves, in order to succeed, we need to win a national championship. It wouldn't even be reasonable at that point. Once OU and Texas leave the Big 12, there is no one even close. Guys, there are no programs, even two or three good recruiting classes close to being in the blue chip ratio of 50% and above club. So either someone's got to buck the entire historical trend of college football or you're just not winning a national title out there. And the same outside of Oregon goes for the Pac-12. Washington would be the next closest, uh, and they're a couple of classes away probably if they ever get back there. But outside of Oregon, there's no one in the Pac-12 once USC leaves that's going to win a title out there either, at least if we follow historical trends. So what do you do? Do you pretend you're still chasing the same thing in those conferences? If we're watching from afar, do we pretend that those conferences are still on the same footing? No. Just why? Well, one of many reasons why I'm not particularly fond of the moves that are happening, but I can't control the moves. What I can control is the prism with which I view the sport through, and I'm going to look out there, and I'm going to say all due respect to the Big 12, Pac-12. You making the playoff, that's your mountaintop. You're not going higher than that. That's kind of the way we look at G5 teams right now. Cincinnati making the playoff last year, that was the mountaintop. It, if you're just being real with yourself. They don't have the horses to compete with an Alabama once they get there. Nor should they, man. They're, they're working from completely different points. Historically, they're working from completely different points. So that's the first thing I took away is, even though we already kind of thought that way, in the future, we'll really look at the Big 12, Pac-12, 
and we'll say, you guys get to the playoff. That's about all you could hope for. But that's kind of obvious. I think the other thing is going towards the whole notion of the super team era, which is what a lot of people have come to describe this era as. The playoff era has started to become described as the super team era. There are some folks out there who think the college football playoff is the reason why a lot of these teams are so good now and they're so loaded. You know that yours truly here doesn't believe that, but let's talk about it. Because there, there are two arguments here. Uh, as I said, Bud wrote in this article, it used to be rare that you had any teams above 70% in the blue chip ratio. It, even for Alabama, it was rare and it was hard for them to get over that 70% threshold of their roster being comprised of four and five star recruits. Then they got there, and for a few years it was just them. And then you had Ohio State creep into the mix, but now we got five teams for the first time ever. We have five teams with a blue chip ratio of 70% or more. For the record, those teams are Bama, Ohio State, Georgia, Oklahoma, and A&M, in that order. What do we make of that? Well, those are super teams. Those are super rosters. I mean, you're talking about a, a fifth team there in A&M that a few years ago would have been challenging for having the best roster in the sport. How does this happen? This is where we differ. I argue with some of you guys. Some of my most loyal viewers and listeners I go back and forth with on this. Some of you guys are just steadfast in your belief that the college football playoff created this vacuum where it just separated the haves and have-nots because a few teams started to make the playoff and then they were disproportionately rewarded in recruiting and financially. And so then they started to separate themselves. You know how that goes. We've talked about that before. You either believe that or you don't believe that. Or maybe you're on the fence. If you're on the fence, just allow me to present my train of thought. My train of thought is I couldn't really care less what postseason format we've been living under. Make no mistake. Now, I'm not even conflicted on this. I believe the reason why you've seen some of those teams separate is the talent drain from California, from Florida, and from Texas. In that order, probably. If the state of California, Southern California, if, if Southern Florida, South Florida, if Texas, if Ohio State and Clemson and Bama and Georgia aren't able to go into those states, especially Bama, to the degree they've been able to, and pluck all that talent, are we looking at the same level of roster? Those teams would still be good. Those teams, proportionally, would probably still be near the top of the sport. You would not be looking at five teams, none of them residing in those states, aside from A&M just now getting into that club, with these rosters that are totally detached from the rest of college football. If you don't believe me, then look at the trajectory over the past several years. Bama wasn't always sitting at 89%. Ohio State wasn't always sitting where they are. That's, that's been a progression upward. And it's been largely due to being able to add athletes from places like South Florida, Texas, and Southern California because the programs there were subpar or poor in performance and they weren't able to keep their talent at home. That's the long and short of it. You can have as many teams or as few teams in your playoff as you want to. If Texas, Texas A&M, USC, Miami, Florida, Florida State, if they're average to good or better, then you've got a totally different landscape even maybe so much so that multiples of those programs would be sitting there in that 70% plus range. As it turns out, none of them are there right now, aside from Texas A&M. A&M is right at 70%. So who's missing from this? Well, I think USC is an obvious candidate there. Uh, the good news for a program like USC and uh, North Carolina and Tennessee is they're one excellent class away. So they're right there in like that 45, 48, 49% range. To, uh, Southern Cal will be back here very soon. I would imagine on this list next year, Southern Cal may be there, and certainly in years to come, they'll be there. Tennessee, got a top 10 recruiting class now. They are on the fast track to marching themselves right back above that 50% threshold. But who else did we not mention? We didn't mention Florida State. They're multiple classes away. We did not mention Stanford. You know, Stanford used to be in here, multiple classes away. Uh, Washington is probably a class or a couple of classes away. And so you start to look across the landscape and are you going to transfer portal your way through this issue? Are you going to NIL your way through this issue? I don't know, but I'll tell you what stood out to me more than anything as I was kind of just looking at this with some time to spare today. Think about how improbable to impossible this sounds. You got the 15 most talented rosters in America. 
Six of the 15 have new head coaches this year. Oklahoma's got a new one. LSU's got a new one. Notre Dame's got a new one. Florida. Uh, who else? Miami's got a new one. Oregon's got a new one. How unprecedented is that? It's normally the places where the roster isn't what it should be, where you're getting new coaches. Six of the top 15 most talented and loaded rosters in the country got new head coaches. Yeah, you've never seen a situation before, in my mind at least, where new head coaches, multiples of them, are walking in the door so ready-made to succeed. Is that a blessing? Yeah. Does it also mean there'll probably be a shorter leash? Yeah. But unlike some places where they give you the shorter leash, but you got a bare cupboard to work with, Brent Venables at Oklahoma, dude, you're right there. You're, you're, in that, you're in that upper, upper percentile of teams that are over 70%. I'm not saying he's got a short leash. I'm just saying, what a blessed situation to inherit. Even at Miami, people look at Miami and think, oh, there's a significant rebuild at hand for Mario Cristobal. No, there's not. They're, they got one of the top 15 rosters in the country, and they're going to recruit better than they have been already. And they're a great transfer portal position program because a lot of South Florida talent leaves, doesn't like it where they are, want to come home. Guess where they land? They land at Miami. So... As you, as you go about your betting this year, don't use this as an absolute guide, of course, but use it as a reference point. If you're on the fence, one team facing another team, it helps to know what's inside. What are those programs made up of? And some of them are made up of a little bit more of that T-word talent than others.